Davis, uh, he's a seismologist. When the March 11th disaster happened in Japan, he was on TV, in American uh, TV program, uh, maybe news uh, program. Uh, he has been commenting on what's happening in Japan throughout uh, uh, many, many hours uh, soon after the disaster happens. So he, he, uh, he has a library experience of that, and he developed his own uh, a website for bridging the gap between the scientific knowledge and the um, users. Uh, what they call the open hazard, I think he will explain that. And also he acts as a member of the active member of the uh, multi-hazard program of the APRU, the Association of uh, Pacific Limb Universities. So I promise you, Mr. John. Uh, many thanks, Richie. Um, so today I would like to talk to you briefly about uh, global earthquake forecasting. <clears throat> um, let me start by just defining what I mean by forecasting versus prediction. Prediction in our terminology is the precise specification of events, such as the next coin toss will turn up heads. That is something which is very easy to validate by a single observation. A forecast, on the other hand, by our definition, is a probability, a statement of probability, such as the next coin toss has a 50% chance of turning up heads. Prediction is very difficult to do for earthquakes. We still have not figured out how to do this precisely. But I should point out that every country in the world has some kind of a forecast. And the reason is because we need to do planning and we need to have earthquake insurance and so forth. However, forecasting is unfortunately been done primarily by big organizations for the benefit of other big organizations rather than uh, for the public. The public often does not know uh, what its risk really is and has no way to find out under the current situation. We as a scientific community have not done a good job of communicating uh, risk and hazard. Uh, I was actually struck by one of Reed Basher's slides that said something that, like the fact that scientists wonder on the one hand why their work is not used, and on the other hand emergency managers wonder why they don't have good products. Uh, to use for uh, the uh, jobs that they have to do. So there's a disconnect between what uh, the scientific community on the one hand has been doing and on the other hand what the consumers of that science uh, have been allowed, the tools they've been allowed to use or they've been provided with. Well, I come from California and in California we have a mechanism for dealing with these things, this kind of problem, and it's called a startup company. So basically what we decided to do at UC Davis was to solve this problem by creating a startup company. So in other words, instead of simply publishing papers, which we've done, we didn't let it stop there. What we actually did was decided to take it through to an operational system. Uh, we were told by our university, by the way, not to put any forecast information on a university website because of legal issues. That's another reason why we decided to start a company. It's because a company has what is called uh, a limited liability. It, it, LLC is a limited liability corporation. That is to say the individuals in the corporation are not liable, actually, for the um, actions of the corporation. It's the corporation itself that uh, holds the liability. So that's another reason. The individuals were protected uh, legally uh, by doing so. so let me start uh, by showing you a slide. This was our most recent damaging earthquake on August 24, 2014 in Napa, um, not too far from uh, where I live. I actually slept through this. Many of my uh, friends in Davis were awakened by this earthquake. And of course, there was significant damage, several hundred million dollars uh, or more of damage uh, in Napa. Um, this is the website that I mentioned. It's called openhazards.com. You can go there. If we had an internet connection, you could go there right now. And this is what you would see. There is a series of, uh, obviously, menus, uh, menu items across the top here. And you can click on those things and get various information. There's um, frequently asked questions, FAQs. There are um, blogs that several of us write. Um, there are some web apps, which are the thing that I will explore uh, briefly uh, and show you how, how they work. And then there's a tab which, uh, from which you can download the, the earthquake catalog that we use together with the probabilities uh, that we use. Um, 
very briefly for the seismologists in the audience, the way this works, uh, the way the forecast works, is that we use the gutenberg richter magnitude frequency relation, which says that, uh, loosely speaking, for every magnitude 6 earthquake, there are 1,000 magnitude 3 earthquakes. So just after the last magnitude 6 earthquake in a region, we start counting small earthquakes. When you get to about another 1,000 threes, when that's happened, it's about time for another magnitude 6. Uh, so you can track your uh, uh, approach to the next earthquake by means, essentially, of the number of small earthquakes that have occurred. It's rather like the small earthquakes are the second hand on a clock and the large earthquakes are the striking the hour, so to speak. We convert that earthquake count to a probability by means of a Weibull distribution, which is a well-known statistical distribu distribution. So this is the uh, hazard viewer page, uh, and what I've done, actually, is to uh, show you California, where we live. This is Los Angeles, so I've used the uh, radio buttons on the left-hand side here to select a 100-kilometer radius region around Los Angeles, and what you get here uh, when you do that are these uh, numbers, these probability numbers. So we can see that uh, in this region around Los Angeles over the next three years from now, uh, there's a pretty certain chance, uh, a 99% chance, of having a magnitude bigger than five during the next three years. That's not a big surprise. For a magnitude 6 in this region, we have a 31% chance in the next three years. And for a magnitude 7, about an 8% chance. So um, this is, uh, tells you something about the level of preparedness that you should uh, in anticipate. In addition to the um, earthquake forecast itself, we have another app that allows you to estimate what the damage might be to your house. And so this app actually uh, asks you in a series of steps to first locate a house somewhere on the map, and then place an earthquake near it somewhere, enter some structural details about the house, and then you get a damage report by clicking on this button. The way this works is that uh, once you specify the earthquake location, we have what is called an attenuation relation, which, is com which computes the estimated ground motion, the peak ground acceleration at the location of the house from the earthquake. And then we have a damage model that um, once you put in the structural details of the house, uh, calculates the estimated damage to the house. So what you get in the end is something like this. When you press that button, um, you get a, a little report page that tells you what the estimated damage was. And for this particular uh, house, the damage would have been about $87,000 from an earthquake in the East Bay on a house in the region of Mountain View or Palo Alto. We also, uh, these days, of course, you have to have a mobile app, so you can get an app for your iPhone. It's free on the App Store, okay? And this is what it looks like. And it has much of the same functionality as the website itself. The Android version is going to be available shortly. Finally, you might be interested in, here we are in Sendai, or in uh, Japan. You can actually get the information, the forecast for Sendai. But I thought I would do Tokyo, so here's a forecast within a 100-kilometer radius circle of Tokyo. And not a big surprise, you have a very significant chance of a magnitude 6 and 7 earthquake uh, near this circle. And even within three years, a uh, possibility of a magnitude 8 earthquake, a 10% probability, okay, which would translate to something like uh, a 1 in 30 chance in any given year of uh, such an earthquake. So that shouldn't be a big surprise to folks in Japan. Uh, it's one of the most seismically active regions on Earth. But a website like this allows you to get some sort of information about what your risk might actually be so you, the public, can take appropriate action and plan. And I'm going to stop there. I think I have about a minute left, but I will stop there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John.